Hello, this is Pastor Malin Smith, pastor here at New Hope Baptist Church here in Watertown in New York, and I welcome you to our ongoing video series, Journeying Through the Books of the Bible. And today we're going to be exploring one of my favorite books of the Bible, namely, the letter of Paul to the Romans. Now, if we were to think about the book of Romans uh, in terms of a word picture, picture, if you will, the Grand Canyon. Uh, if you've ever seen pictures of the Grand Canyon, you'll note how vast uh, the Grand Canyon is, as well as deep. Uh, the beauty of it and the, maj the majesty of it. And that's why people will travel for thousands of miles just to go to view it. And that's how I liken the book of Romans. The book of Romans is really the canyon of the New Testament epistles or letters. And when we talk about epistles, uh, just as a side note, epistle is another term for letter. And the book of Romans uh, is really the first epistle that we have come across in this particular series. An epistle uh, contains four basic parts. You have an introductory part, and then you, there's usually a second part devoted to doctrine or instruction. Then there's a third part that is devoted uh, to exhortation or uh, telling people how they ought to live in light of that doctrine or teaching. And then there's usually a small part near the end uh, that concludes the epistle or letter. And unlike letters or emails or texts uh, where we'll typically write the message and then sign our names at the bottom, an epistle will automatically introduce you to the author near the beginning. For example, here in Romans 1 verse 1, Paul. So we already know who the author of the epistle to the Romans is, and that was a common feature of ancient epistles or letters. So the book of Romans represents that particular form of writing that we call the epistle. And here in the book of Romans, the theme of the book of Romans is the power of the gospel. And we find this in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where the apostle Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. That's Romans 1, verses 16 to 17. So the theme and the purpose for Paul writing the book of Romans is to help us to understand the gospel and more specifically why it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Now, there are a number of ways that we could outline the book of Romans in order to understand it, but what I decided to do today was to just simply put some short phrases up here on the board as we walk away through the book of Romans. Namely, the book of Romans shows us that we're saved from something, saved to something, saved because of something, saved through something, saved according to something, and then lastly, saved for something. And of course, you can see here on the board uh, the chapters that designate each part in the book of Romans. But when we talk about how the book of Romans uh, focuses upon this theme of the power of the gospel, we can first of all note how the gospel saves us from something. And what is it that the gospel saves us from? It saves us from sin wrath, and alienation. When you look at the first three chapters of the book of Romans, chapter 1 begins and introduces us to the gospel. It says here in verse 2, which he promised, chapter 1, verse 2, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son. So the gospel centers upon the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you go through the remainder of chapter 1 into chapter 2, and in the chapter 3, we discover that man has three problems. He has a moral problem or an ethical problem. He has a relational problem. And he has a spiritual problem. Morally or ethically speaking, man has sin. Born into this world, having contracted sin from Adam and Eve. Uh, spiritually, he is alienated from God. He's separated from God. And thus, re relationally, that makes us enemies of God. So, fallen sinful man is morally, spiritually, and relationally estranged from God, separated from God. And so that's what the first three chapters 
uh, describe man as being. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So that summarizes the first three chapters. Sometimes perhaps when you have heard gospel presentations, the evangelist will make the appeal, you need to be saved, you need to be saved. But saved from what? Well, saved from sin and wrath and alienation. So that's what the first three chapters of the book of Romans expresses to us. Then we understand that we're not only saved from something, but the gospel also has the power to save us to something. To what? To live by, for, and in Christ. And that's what we see in chapters 3 to 8 of this wonderful epistle. In chapters 3 and 4, we're introduced to the doctrine of justification by faith. That's God's legal declaration of the sinner at the moment of saving faith, where they're no longer under the penalty of the law of God condemning them as sinners, but in Christ, by faith, now they are declared to be innocent of all charges before a holy, righteous God. And in justification, we are credited with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So that's in chapters 3 and 4. In chapter 5, we're reconciled to God. So that takes care of the relational problem that we already saw expressed in the first three chapters. In chapter 6, we're introduced to the doctrine of sanctification. You see, we are not only justified by faith, but we are saved to be able to live by faith, and that faith has works that follows it. And sanctification is the process whereby I'm being made more and more like Jesus Christ in my thoughts and attitudes and actions. And all that's being done by the Holy Spirit. Now in chapter 7, we're introduced to the concept of how the Christian has this internal battle that's ever going on the inside of them. Uh, Christians sometimes wonder why it is that when they become a Christian, that they still deal with the sins of the flesh and the temptations of the world. Well, that's because we're in process. And so chapter 7 reminds us of how we have this ongoing battle between the old way of doing things versus now this newfound way of doing things, this new nature which has been implanted into us uh, by the Holy Spirit. When we come to chapter 8 now, we see how we have the victorious Christian life, how we have been adopted into God's family. And then we come to the end of chapter 8, and that's where we see the wondrous truth of prayer, where Paul talks about how we have a prayer life as Christians. And I love Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28 says how all things work together for the good, to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. So in chapters 3 to 8, we see that we are saved to live by, for, and in Christ. But then that leads us next to, we're saved because of what? In other words, why is it that anyone gets saved? Why is it that anyone becomes a Christian? Well, we're saved because of God's grace. God's gracious choice. Now, Romans 8.28, again, says, For we know that God causes all things to work together for the good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. But then in Romans 8.29, we're introduced to some new words. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. And so you'll see some words such as election and predestination and foreknowledge. And all those terms simply refer to God's grace that preceded my decision for Jesus Christ. Now let me just say this, there is no contradiction whatsoever between God's sovereignty and human responsibility. The Bible teaches both. You need it not to reconcile friends because the Bible teaches that God is the one who works to bring about our salvation and yet it is our responsibility by faith to receive such salvation. And so we're saved because of God's grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 reminds us, For by grace are you saved through faith. This is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. And that's what Romans chapter 9 and its message is all about. Which leads us then to 
what are we saved through? We're saved through faith. Romans 10. Romans 10, 9 says, if you'll confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So what is it that makes the gospel so powerful? Well, it saves us from sin, wrath, and alienation if we will but receive it by faith. We're saved to live by, for, and in Christ. We're saved because of God's grace. We're saved through faith. And we find out we're saved according to a particular plan, namely God's plan. In chapter 11, Paul focuses particular attention upon the nation of Israel. Where does Israel fit into God's overall plan of redemption? If we were to compare the Old and the New Testament, the Old Testament tells us the account of how God called a particular nation out of all the nations of the earth to bring about his plan of salvation, to reveal his word, and to bring about the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we come to the New Testament, we find out that God is calling forth particular persons out of all the nations of the world to compose what is his church. So some people might be tempted to think, well, that means then that Israel is done and that God no longer has a purpose for her. Ah, but Romans 11 says that all Israel will be saved, which means that when Christ returns, Israel will turn to her as Messiah. Right now, she is temporarily set aside for the purposes of God, by his spirit, calling forth people from all nations, tribes, and tongues to believe on him as Savior and Lord. But the time will come when God will fulfill his promises to Israel. And therefore, Israel, she represents a case study in how God keeps his promises to his people. And so there is a plan according to which we are saved, which leads us to the last part. What are we saved for? And chapters 12 to 16 of Paul's letter is that life practical section. Remember, an epistle has both an instructional section and then we have a life practical section. And so we find out we're saved for godly living. In chapter 12, we're instructed to focus on Christ. In chapter 13, we're taught Christian responsibility and how time is short, and thus we must do all that we can to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 14 of Romans, we're given particular principles for making godly decisions. In chapter 15, we're told the resources for which we can grow our Christian faith. And then in chapter 16, we see some final instructions, particularly to individuals, and we can glean some principles as to how we can be responsible church members in each of our local churches. So the book of Romans closes with a final little section showing us how God is the source of the gospel. And I just want to read uh, the last verse to you. Romans chapter 16, verse 26 says this, But now is manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Amen. That's Romans 16, verses 26 to 27. And that epilogue we could call as God being the source of the gospel. And thus, this is why the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. This is Pastor Malin Smith, and I thank you today for watching our video.